the Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Now, before we get started, I'll introduce our speaker. Vicki Koblener is a registered dietitian and nutritionist with years of experience in applying a functional approach to nutrition. She develops individualized plans for clients which are designed to promote wellness, prevent disease, and rebalance underlying nutritional impairment. This webinar is made possible thanks to generous donor support, including a grant from Local 25 Boston Teamsters. Now I will turn it over to Vicki. Thanks, Denise. I appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, nutritional psychiatry is one of my passions because I feel like it's one of the most overlooked areas where nutrition plays a role, a, a huge role, and yet we don't utilize its powers. So I'm going to talk a lot. It can be kind of a bit of a science heavy presentation, but I'm going to try to keep it light. You can go back and look at these. You know, you will have access to the webinar later, so you can go back and look at some of the slides again. But I really want to cover the top line of how we can use nutrition to help mood, um, especially for kids on the spectrum. So I just wanted to start with this, to open with this. I think we all, if, if you're on an ARI website, you probably have already heard about the importance of the gut in terms of neurologic function. But this was, the reason I put this up here is because it was um, just February 5th. This came out, this one science article. And there have been multiple ones coming up in my newsfeed since then. So we know that there are so many, thousands and thousands of studies that have been done on the role of gut bacteria and mood. And we have a new one coming out now highlighting specific bacteria in the microbiome that may be able to influence neurotransmitters. So we know that the gut is, it is called the second brain. I often call it the first brain because really it communicates more to the, the brain and the brain communicates the other way. About um, more than half of communication from, from brain and gut is induced by the gut. So we can never forget the role of keeping our gut healthy in mood. The other thing I wanted to really underscore here is this statement, which I find um, very telling. People are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health, and they are treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. And this is something that is so critical because health and food cannot be separated. They, in any traditional society, in any place where we haven't become so industrialized, food is the key component of normal health, whether it's physical, neurologic, or any other kind of health. And yet in this country, we tend to think of these things completely separately. Foods come from a box. They really have no relation to how our bodies need to be nurtured. And our health providers are often not thinking about that foundational food as the source of the nutrients that keep us healthy. So how does nutritional biochemistry affect neuropsychiatric health? Well, in a variety of ways, one of which is protein. So we know that protein is comprised of amino acids. Amino acids are the essential precursors for neurotransmitter production. So you can't make neurotransmitters if you don't eat good quality protein, no matter how much SSRI, how many SSRIs you take, those are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They keep the body kind of holding on to its serotonin. Serotonin is made by protein precursors. So you need the protein so you can support the serotonin more than necessarily you need the SSRI to keep it high. Without the SSR, without the protein, it's not going to work. Vitamins and minerals, those are required cofactors for neurotransmitter production. So with, again, I'm gonna show you some slides that explain this in more detail, but without the base fundamental vitamins and minerals, it's like you don't have the keys to turn the locks to keep moving forward through one door into the next. The microbiome, I just mentioned the gut health and that bi-directional communication, the fact that the communication from the gut to the brain is super important. We also know that nutrition and diet can modulate epigenetic triggers. So when we think about genes, we often think about genes being something that are set in stone and can't be changed. But in truth, many genes can be modified, the way they behave can be modified by the foods we eat and the herbs we consume and things like that. So we can change our genetic, we can't change the genes themselves, but we can change how they are activated by the food we eat. 
Um, I always use it as an example, the BRCA gene. So having the BRCA gene may not, does not mean you have breast cancer, but it does, there are things you can do to modulate your diet and your lifestyle to keep the BRCA gene from activating into breast cancer. So we can modulate our genes with diet and nutrition. Um, another thing that's really important is inflammation. And depression has been questioned to be a chronic inflammatory disease. There is a very strong link between inflammation and mood disorders. So if we're looking at somebody who's chronically inflamed, as many of our kids are, we know that there's gonna be a predisposition and more propensity to have a mood disorder because the inflammation is so high. And finally, mitochondrial disease or dysfunction. Mitochondrial dysfunction is um, not the same as mitochondrial disease, but the mitochondria are energy producing engines of the cells. And they, they also dictate a lot of what goes on in many, many biochemical pathways. They also are, are intrinsically implicated in how we deal with oxidative stress, which is stress caused by biochemical reactions in the body. So the mitochondria are essential for that. And when we modulate those, we can also improve our mood. So let's talk a little bit about the standard American diet, which is the acronym SAD is very appropriate. We know that in the past decades, we've seen a significant decline in fruit and vegetable intake. And yet fruits and vegetables are, the, are two of the food co components that are the most important for keeping us healthy, for normalizing the microbiome, for providing those nutritional cofactors, for helping us deal with stress. The fruits and vegetables are the things that help there, and most specifically vegetables. We also know it's been a long time. It's been 75 years or so, but sugar in the 1940s was the consumption of excess sugar, not from natural sources, was about two pounds a year. In 2016, it was 152 pounds. Sugar is inflammatory. By its very nature, it increases inflammation. So if mood disorders are inflammatory in nature as well, the sugar intake is part of the reason that we have this increased inflammation. In addition, to, in order for our bodies to process the sugar that we eat, it requires a certain biochemical pathway called the Krebs or TCA cycle. That cycle requires lots and lots of B vitamins and magnesium. Now, B vitamins and magnesium, as you're going to see, are two of the nutrients that are so essential for normal neurotransmitter function. So if we're wasting our B vitamins and magnesium trying to process this extra sugar, we're increasing our inflammation and we're wasting those important nutrients that could be used better elsewhere. We know, that, as I said, that it increases inflammation, and it also reduces something called BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotropic factor and is also essential for normal brain health. So sugar, you know, we have a taste for it because naturally our bodies want some, but the more you eat, the more you crave, and the more you become acclimated to it. So really, one of the most powerful things we can do is look for ways to reduce the added sugar in our diet. That can have a profound effect on all aspects of health. The other thing we see a lot is a decline in fish intake. And part of that is because of our fears of the contamination of fish. But when we choose healthy fish or when we use an omega-3 fatty acid supplement that is a clean one, a high quality clean supplement, then we can add back those omega-3s, which are absolutely essential for brain health. And we're gonna show you again in some of my later slides why the fish oil is so important. Inadequate fiber in the diet. Another cornerstone marker for a poor American diet is lack of fiber. And again, fiber is absolutely critical for feeding the good bacteria that help our microbiome. So without good fiber, we don't have a good healthy gut. And without a good healthy gut, it's hard to have good brain health. And finally, our increased consumption of refined and processed foods, which includes the sugar that I mentioned, but also includes lots of highly processed foods that are low in nutrition, low in fiber, but high in sugar. So that's kind of the diet that we're faced with. Now, to make this a little more clear or powerful in your mind, this is a study that was done. Um, this was 2011 to 2012. I haven't seen the more recent one yet, but it's very, very telling. The first nine segments from total fruit to fatty acids from here to here have to do with what are our goals for healthy intake. Now, what you'll notice, this is children age two to five. So we're really talking about toddlers very well controlled by parents still. Then we have kids six to 11. And finally, our kids 12 to 17. This is what they're eating. So in terms of total fruit intake, 
When children are toddlers, they tend to eat a fair amount of fruit. They're meeting their need. As they get older, they're, they're not, no longer meeting the goal for food intake. Um, now let's look at vegetables. This is the one that's of greatest concern because this is the food that is the most important in any diet. Plant-based diets, especially vegetable-based diets, are the cornerstone of good health. Look at how we've actually never achieved the goal of adequate vegetable intake. And to be honest, my goal for vegetable intake would really be about here. So we are so, our children are so far below that. Look at greens and beans. We barely touch them. Kids are mostly eating carrots and potatoes get included in some of that vegetable intake. Really, we're looking for greens and we're not even approaching a desirable level. Protein foods, we tend to do fairly well on. Seafood, our omega-3s are inadequate here. We're not getting that good omega-3 fish oil, so we need to supplement it if we're not eating it. Um, but again, plant proteins. Again, that's another piece of this. We eat a lot of animal protein. We don't eat a lot of plant proteins, leggings, nuts, seeds, etc. So we really want to focus on those because they also provide you know, rich in fiber and rich in omega-3s. Whole grains, and again, this is not something I push as well. Many of us are promoting lower carb, lower, you know, gluten-free diets. I don't really push the whole grains as much, but what this means is not that people aren't eating grains. It means they're not eating whole grains. So what they're doing is they're eating a lot of starches. They're just eating nutrient-poor ones. Dairy, we tend to meet our goals for. Again, dairy in this population is something that we may not even want them to be eating. Less of a concern for me. But when we look at the fatty acids, that is very problematic. Now, these three are things that we really don't want um, as much to see. We, the goal here is to have it be high. And again, where we want it to be high, it's low. They're eating, the empty calories would be, the less you eat empty calories, the higher it goes. So here we see there's too many empty calories, too much sodium. And again, I am less concerned with sodium than the standard rec recommendations. But in terms of refined grains and in terms of empty calories, this is a big deal. Our diets are extraordinarily depleted in many of the nutrients we need for brain health. So let's talk about those nutrients. What are they? Well. Let's start with fatigue, kids who are chronically tired, or moms who are chronically tired, or dads as well. What do we need for good health? B vitamins, lots and lots of B vitamins. Remember, sugar wastes those. We also need our fat-soluble vitamins. We also need carnitine, which comes from animal protein, chromium, zinc, many minerals. Biotin is another B vitamin. These all come from protein. Magnesium is another mineral. So again, lots of different nutrients necessary to make sure that we have the energy that we need to function properly. Because remember, our brains need energy. The brain is a very, very large user of energy. So when we feel fatigue, that's happening to our brain as well. Now let's talk about attention and focus. You're gonna see a lot of the same nutrients. Again, B vitamin, magnesium, zinc, two super, super important minerals that we need for brain health. Folate, now again, when we talked about epigenetics, there are, see this, people with the MTHFR gene are predisposed to folate deficiency and more likely to have ADHD. So specific forms of folate can be more beneficial. We will talk about that a little more going forward. We talked about oxidative stress and how the mitochondria helps with that. Having lots of good antioxidants is helpful. Um, so we need to make sure our diet is rich in those, are rich in those antioxidants. Choline comes from fat. Very often, eggs are an excellent source of protein. Choline, absolutely critical for good brain health. And glutamine comes from protein as well. Um, very important for gut health, also important, but can be um, activating in some people. So we need to be a little careful with this one. Now let's look at anxiety. You're gonna to start to see a pattern here. Our folate, our chromium, our carnitine, our choline, magnesium, zinc, B6, again, a lot of the same nutrients and even additional ones are absolutely 100% implicated in normal mood stabilization. So when we don't get these nutrients, you can take as many meds as you want, but you are not going to be able to produce the neurotransmitters the way you should. Let's look again. We're seeing lots and lots of repetition here in terms of the nutrients that are necessary. We're talking about minerals. We're talking about different B vitamins, protein precursors, and antioxidants, all incredibly important for protecting against depression. So in terms of that, 
There's a number of studies, and again, I'm going to try to go through this fairly quickly, but impact of dietary patterns. How do our dietary patterns affect depression? On a global scale, when we look at the big picture epidemiologically, which means we look at patterns that happen in a population, not specific people. Western diet, association of Western diet and traditional diets with depression and anxiety. Association of Mediterranean diet pattern with the incidence of depression, inversely related. The Western diet causes it, the Mediterranean diet reduces depression. Now, this particular study, fast food and commercial baked goods. Study was done looking at the consumption of both fast foods and commercial baked goods, cakes, pies, etc. Increase in depression in people who, the higher percentile that you ate of these foods, the higher the likelihood that you would have depression. In this sample, significantly greater improvement with major depression in dietary interventions. Now, the thing that I wanted to really, the reason I use this and why I want to point it out is this thing called the NNT, the number needed to treat. So what that means is in order for you to get an effect, how many people need to do this? So the remission score was 4.1, which means you need four people need to do this for one of them to actually see benefit. That may seem like, well, it's only 25%, but in many trials of medications, the number needed to treat can be 100, and it's still considered an effective medication. A number needed to treat of four is pretty fantastic. So there is an organization called the International Society for Nutritional Psychiatry Research, and I, love, I pulled this quote from something that they had, um, a statement they had come out with. Evidence is steadily growing for the relation between dietary quality and potential nutritional deficiencies and mental health and for the select use of nutrient-based supplements to address deficiencies or as monotherapies, which means it alone, or augmentative therapies added to a medication. We advocate recognition of diet nutrition as central determinants of physical and mental health. So we can use nutrients as the foundation of, of mood, and neuros neuropsychiatric health. We can also use it as an adjunct to medication when medication is needed. And I'm not against medication. I think we should all be doing whatever we can to help those we love and ourselves as well. But if we ignore the foundational goal of nutrition, we are not taking care of ourselves. So to reinforce mood and sugar, as I mentioned, it decreases BDNF, which is essential for normal brain health. It wastes the minerals that we need, things like magnesium and calcium. It increases those pro-inflammatory cytokines. So again, we're increasing that inflammation, which causes depression. And we are also increasing the need and the use of B vitamins, which are then wasted and can't be used to make neurotransmitters. And again, there is a multitude of, multitude of studies that show sugar consumption increases depression. And this is just a few of them. But they consistently report the same thing. Now, stress is another thing that impairs digestive function. It inhibits and interferes with every aspect of it. You can't activate, it interferes with your microbiome. It, it wastes the nutrients you need. And it also increases oxidative stress. So when people are very, very stressed, it's hard for them to actually even access and utilize the nutrients that they ingest. When you are not ingesting a good quality diet, as we saw with that slide with all the bars before, if you're not ingesting enough of it, and then you're stressed on top of that, the deficit, the, the divide between those two things is going to get greater and greater. So it's real important to shore up the good nutrition. So many of you may, heard of, may, may have heard of these words. Some of you, it may be new. They sound complicated, methylation, transsulfuration, folate, et cetera. However, I'm, again, not going to spend a lot of time in this slide, but I'm going to show you how they, where they function in the next couple of slides. So methylation is a, is a process that's required for normal detoxification, it's required for normal um, brain health, and it requires B vitamins, many minerals, and when it doesn't work, it's linked to inflammation. So when our methylation pathways don't work right, we see changes in mood. Transsulfuration is an adjunct pathway linked to methylation, requires many of the same things, requires B vitamins, requires minerals, but also impacts how we produce glutathione. And glutathione is one of the most powerful antioxidants in our body and the primary um, fat compound used in detoxification. So when we don't make enough glutathione or when we have so much inflammation and so much toxicity that we can't, that we use up our glutathione, we need to support the, the production of it. Now, again, what that requires is not only the vitamins and minerals, but it actually requires protein because protein precursors are what is used to make glutathione. 
Our folate cycle is another piece of this pathway. It's another, you can imagine it as cogs that are all turning and when one stops, the other ones can continue to turn. All of these pathways are like cogs. So folate cycle requires B vitamins, also requires that an active form of methyl tetrahydrofolate. Folate is ingested as natural folate, but then what we do in our body is we convert it to an active form called MTHF. Now, certain people have a gene mutation that makes their MTHF less, their MTHFR less efficient. It doesn't convert to that active folate as well. So for those people, they may need supplemental MTHF to help them get there. BH4 is another compound that is important for serotonin and dopamine production, and serotonin and dopamine are our two primary neurotransmitters. So this is the one of the little um, guides that I wanted to show you. You don't have to memorize this, you don't have to learn it, but just look here. Tryptophan is an amino acid. It's what we use to make serotonin. In the process of making serotonin, the tryptophan is changed into 5-HTP, then it is changed to serotonin, but look at what it needs. Look at what's required in order to make that conversion work. Iron, MTHF, that active form of folate. So remember, if you have a gene that makes you inefficient, you need more of this active folate. You need B3, which is niacin, vitamin C, vitamin D, and P5P is an active form of B6. So without those, you can take, nowhere here do I see Zola. Nowhere here do I see Prozac. We need nutrients to make these neurotransmitters. And again, I'm not against medication, but if you're not providing the foundational nutrients, it's going to be very hard for those meds to do what they want to do. Let's look at tyrosine, making dopamine. Many of the same nutrients, the same base, baseline cofactors, iron, MTHF, that active folate, niacin, vitamin C, vitamin D, B6. And then as we move along those pathways and move farther, you'll see other nutrients come into play, riboflavin, um, copper, adenosyl methionine, which Sam E, you may have heard of. There's a number of different nutrients that get involved. And then down at the bottom, we talked a little bit about glutamine. And glutamine is kind of excitatory. Um, well, glutamate is excitatory, actually. And glutamate can be converted into GABA. The body does that kind of in a seesaw basis. When you need to get active, you produce more glutamate. And when you need to come down, you produce GABA. Very often what we see is people who are very anxious can't make that conversion. They can't calm their glutamate and turn it into GABA. That requires vitamin B6, requires a few other things as well. But so I hope you're getting the picture here that it's very, very important for us to shore up our nutritional status so that we can make these important neurotransmitters. Now, this is quite the, path, the series of pathways. But again, no need to memorize it. Just want to point out a few things. Um, you see in this circle here, this is where we, where we talk about making glutathione. This requires zinc, B12, um, other nutrients as well. B6 is required down here. That moves into that folate pathway where we see the, the five, the active folate. And that moves into another pathway where at the bottom here we see serotonin and dopamine. So in order for us to make serotonin and dopamine, there's that BH4 we talked about. Here are our precursors. But in order to keep this wheel turning, this wheel needs to turn, and this wheel needs to turn. And that's why all of them are so intimately related to each other. So don't have to memorize. Just follow, if you can follow that, the, the briefness of that pathway, just remember those cogs, those turning wheels, and the fact that one turns the other, and we need them all to work properly. So. I hope you figured out by now B vitamins are absolutely critical for methylation, transsulfuration, and folate cycle. Those are all those cogs that I just showed you required for making those neurotransmitters. But some key things to take away, B vitamins are often depleted by stress. So again, we need not just base amounts, we need therapeutic amounts of these vitamins to overcome the stress we may be feeling. Increased sugar intake, as I mentioned, is going to deplete them. So we need to reduce the sugar in our diets. And Moms, oral contraceptives re re deplete your B vitamins. So if you're taking oral contraceptives, you are not going to have probably enough B vitamins. And that's really important because you are probably stressed and probably not eating as well as you should. And when you do this, you're impacting your body's ability to make those good neurotransmitters. So 
If you're on an oral contraceptive, it's important to support with some additional B vitamins. Now, B vitamins require activation by gastric acid. A poor microbiome will interfere with that. In addition, PPIs will interfere with it. So if you're taking medication for reflux, if it's a proton pump inhibitor, you are not going to be activating your B vitamins. Very, very important to make sure that you're able to use active forms of B vitamins. And again, in my experience, PPI, PPIs are not supposed to be used long-term. They never were. Um, we tend to get on them and never get off. But there are ways you can get off PPIs and address reflux organically, which is my preferred method. Um, in addition, something like a B12 deficiency reduces NMDA receptor activity. Now, NMDA receptors are also part, uh, are intimately involved in your transmitter signaling, and if your NMDA receptors aren't working properly, it's going to affect your neurotransmitter function. And B12 deficiency will result in reduced activity. So again, multiple, multiple studies show the role of B vitamins in neuropsychiatric health. We're not going to focus on these too much, but this one is particularly important, enhancement of the antidepressant action of fluoxetine by folic acid. So when you add folic acid, in the proper form, you do see improvements in medication function now, or efficacy. Now, again, number needed to treat was four. And in this case, the folate levels were low, but they were normal, low normal. And yet, adding the folate improved function. Now, this one, if you see what I've circled here, in women, adding an active folate, adjunctive folate treatment with fluoxetine, improved response rate, 93% response rate improvement. That's pretty powerful. Now, again, the placebo also had a pretty big improvement, but the response in women was significantly greater than the placebo. And here's that MTHF. Here's that active folate used as monotherapy, as the only therapy in depression, used with as adjunctive therapy added to a medication. Effective adjunctive methylfolate, very, very important. Methylfolate can really be helpful. Now, some of you may or may not be aware, there is a medication called Deplin. Deplin is nothing but methylfolate. That's what it is. And it's used as an um, antidepressant. However, the prescription form of methylfolate also comes with things like lactose and artificial colors and all these other things that I don't think are beneficial and I would prefer that you know, we don't consume. So my preference is to just take the straight methylfolate and not necessarily go with the prescription. But if the prescription is covered by insurance, you have to balance those two things. So again, one of the other things about methylfolate that's important to remember, I know that many of the, the patients that we work with, many of the kids with ASD are being tested for cerebral folate deficiency. And if you're not aware of what that is, you should investigate it more because it is important. Um, but cerebral folate deficiency is when the body produces antibodies to folate receptors. Now, we see that when patients have cerebral folate deficiency, they have improvement in their depressive symptoms when treated with a different form of folate called folinic. Folinic, in the, in the activation pathway, folinic comes a little bit before MTHF. It can also be very helpful because it is more active in the base form. So if we know that we have a child with cerebral deficiency, we do want to be thinking about helping them support that folate pathway. It's very important. Looking at magnesium, an hugely important mineral, fabulous for calming. Many of you, you know, magnesium salt, Epsom salts is magnesium sulfate. Those baths can be calming both to muscles but also to brain. I use magnesium very often as part of my therapy for anxiety. And again, we see with depression and anxiety, using magnesium can have powerful effects. The same is true for zinc. And we noticed in those early slides that I showed you that zinc and magnesium were both critical for all those pathways. So let's think about vitamin D. We also noticed that vitamin D was essential for normal mood health. And in a meta-analysis, that means taking a bunch of studies and kind of analyzing the analysis. Um, good quality studies showed a statistically significant improvement in depression with vitamin D supplementation. Now, there's a lot of bad studies out there. This meta-analysis tried to throw out those bad studies, just use the good ones, and found a significant focus. Now, one of the reasons for that, let's look at this. I do happen to be a little bit of a science nerd in some cases, so let's look at this pathway here. This is inside the brain on the right, outside the brain on the left. 
stress causes an increase in certain markers, we'll call them IDO and TDO. They are produced by tryptophan when tryptophan is going in the wrong direction. Um, and the, it results in kinuretic acid, which is very um, inflammatory and not desirable. What we don't want, and tryptophan goes in that direction when it doesn't have enough support to go into the, to cross the blood-brain barrier. Now, if you notice up top there, it says exercise. Exercise um, is helpful for getting tryptophan across the blood-brain barrier because it actually uses up something called branched-chain amino acids, and those fight with tryptophan to get into the, to cross the blood-brain barrier. So when the branched-chain amino acids are used for exercise, it's kind of like the goalie that's not really paying attention, and you can kick something into the goal. So the tryptophan can get kicked into the goal, it can cross the blood-brain barrier, and what you'll see there is you need that BH4, which we mentioned. We also need iron. It also needs B6, which is that P5P, is that active form of B6. Ultimately, it makes the serotonin. And the ser this is the 5-HIAA is another name of serotonin. But look here. Once we've got that tryptophan across that blood-brain barrier, what do we need? We need high vitamin D. And then when we make the 5-HT, which is the precursor, we need EPA and DHA. EPA and DHA come from fish oil. So we need our good omega-3s, we need our high vitamin D before we can make serotonin. If you look at the bottom at B, you'll see with low vitamin D, low, P, low EPA and low DHA, there's a lot less receptor activity, a lot less production, and we're struggling to make that serotonin. And look at what we see there as outcomes. Poor executive function, poor sensory gating, impulsive behavior. All of those will happen when we don't have enough vitamin D or enough omega-3s. They are the baseline, the foundation of what we need for good mental health. Now, inflammation, I've mentioned that before repeatedly. There are studies and, and theories that depression is in and of itself an inflammatory disease. And we know that there are many reasons that inflammation is linked to depression. It is often present in inflammatory illness. Now, that could be because when you have an acute illness, you feel sick and you feel lousy. But we also know that when we see markers for inflammation in the body, the risk of developing future depression is elevated. We also know that when you, when you administer something to, you know, to rats in, in the lab, when you give somebody, give, a, give a, a rat something that causes inflammation, it will induce depressive symptoms. And that when you take medications that cause significant inflammation, depression often is the outcome of that as well. So this is a little graphic of how that happens. And you'll see, again, we have that IDO, we have the tryptophan in the center, wanting to make serotonin, unable to make serotonin because it's being shunted off to make those other things because those inflammatory markers are interfering. And the result of that is that we end up with things like depressive disorder and neurodegeneration. So when our tryptophan cannot be converted into serotonin because there's too much inflammatory interference, we are going to run into trouble. And this is a, um, a study that looked at traditional antidepressant medications. That's in the third column right down the middle there. Things like Prozac and Zoloft and Lexapro and all kinds of different ones. Generally, what it looked at is what cytokines were affected by these medications. And in many cases, what we see is that inflammatory cytokines were reduced and therefore, it may be possible that the reason these anti, antipsychotics, antidepressants, anti-anxiety meds work is because they're actually reducing inflammation. So if we can reduce inflammation in a more natural way, that's obviously a goal. And one of those natural ways is with the omega-3s. So we see numbers, you know, again, numerous studies looking at the role of omega-3s in improving the outcomes of antidepressants or just improving mood in general. So now let's talk about the gut-brain access and the microbiome. We know that there is a very high relationship, commonality between GI and psychiatric illnesses. Now, is it chicken and egg, or is it because they are intimately linked in their, act, in their effects? Um, or is it just that when you have a GI problem, you feel bad about it? It is more likely that there is a relation between the two. So as I mentioned before, bidirectional communication and regulatory systems, mostly coming from the brain, from the gut to the brain instead of vice versa, but it does go both ways. 
and messages that are sent and received through those neural pathways also are sent through the bloodstream. So we've got different ways to communicate. All of them can be affected by the health of the gut. Stress is going to impact the gut negatively. And changes in what we eat are going to alter our gut negatively. We know that there are um, microbes that can actually, probiotics that seem to improve mood. The other thing that I thought was really interesting and I wanted to point out was this study. Treatment with a single antibiotic course was associated with higher risk for depression in all antibiotic groups after five years. This was a large study they did looking at people who had been exposed to antibiotics. Five courses of antibiotics increased the likelihood of depression and anxiety um, profoundly. So we really need to be aware, we, you know, there are times when antibiotics are important, but we really need to figure out what they're doing. Is it because of the good bacteria, the change in the microbiome? Is that what's causing this increased risk for depression and anxiety? We don't really know. But what we know is we have to treat our gut, you know, very carefully, and we have to treat it well. Here's a study that looked at a specific uh, probiotic formulation and studies of both a depression scale and a perceived stress scale. And the dotted areas are the probiotics. The clear areas are those who didn't get the probiotics. And this was the percentage of change in their mood in the positive for those. So those who took the probiotic had a significantly increased change in their mood based on those who didn't. We know the probiotics. And remember that first slide I showed you? We know that the bacteria affects the brain and affects mood. Now, this was a study that looked at a combination probiotic, multi-species probiotic, which had a significant impact on cognitive reactivity to say a mood. It actually reduced rumination. So ruminate, ruminative thoughts are those where you think over and over again about the same thing and you kind of can't get away from it. Aggressive and ruminative thoughts were two of the things that were best improved by this probiotic combination. And this was actually, this probiotic combination is now, has been made into a supplement that you can buy. It's um, called Target GBX. And it has some good data behind it. We can't talk about mood without talking about gluten and the role that gluten plays in affecting our brain. Now, again, I don't necessarily know that gluten should be avoided by everyone, but there is a large percentage of the population that we know can benefit, not only just if you have celiac disease, but you can have gluten intolerance, which is not celiac disease, and you can, be, you can also be affected by gluten. We know that in the literature, there are many, many articles that relate gluten to seizure disorders, to ataxia, to neuropathy, to schizophrenia, to depression, to migraine, and lots of other neurological disorders as well, as well as autoimmune disorders. So gluten can be problematic. In, we know that people who have very often, um, in this study, patients with neurological disease had much higher circulating anti-gliadin antibodies to gluten. Anti-gliadin antibodies attack gluten. Um, but we see this over and over again. There are more that, there's more than one study that looks at the evidence of gluten antibodies in people with mood disorder. And one of the possible reasons for that, there are many, but one of the possible reasons for that is we talked a little bit before about glutamine being exciting and GABA being calming and how the body generally goes on a seesaw, moving from one to the other based on what the body needs. Now, the, the enzyme that helps move glutamine, the exciter, to GABA, the calmer, is glutamate, glutamic acid decarboxylase. Now that enzyme can be impacted negatively by gluten. It, in, gluten can interfere with the activity of that enzyme, which means you're stuck in excitation, you're stuck in glutamine, you can't get to GABA. So the gluten can interfere with the GAD and produce an antibody that makes it less functional and make it harder to decompress to produce GABA. Now, mitochondrial function has also been studied and its role in major depression and spectrum disorders, affective spectrum disorders, which are the panoply of mood disorders. Um, so we know, again, that mitochondria have a profound effect on inflammation and reactive oxygen species. So when we address mitochondria, we're able to modulate mood. Mitochondria has a role in addressing inflammation. And we know that many drugs that treat depression actually exert effects on the mitochondria. 
So we want to think about how we can how we can benefit, how we can make the mitochondria function better. And some of the things that help the mitochondria function are antioxidants. Um, things like coenzyme Q10, vitamin E, glutathione, all of those, omega-3s, all of those are going to help because they act as antioxidants. Zinc is also important here. And what we see is that many people who have depression have lower levels of these potent antioxidants. So we want to support them. Again, this reinforces the same thing. Another really powerful antioxidant is N-acetylcysteine. And N-acetylcysteine may have its antioxidant, may do a variety of things that help with depression, but there are a number of studies that show that it helps. It is a potent antioxidant. It also is a pre it contains the pre one of the precursors that you need to make glutathione. So for both those reasons, that can be very, very important and helpful. Here's another study that shows the role of NAC in depressive disorders, episodes in bipolar disorder. So eight of 10 participants on NAC had a treatment response at the endpoint. That's pretty powerful because most medications don't get that kind of, now this is a very small study, bear in mind it was 17 people, but you know, studies that are done on medications are done on far greater numbers, but eight out of 10 participants had a positive response to NAC. That's pretty powerful. So again, um, let's go back to those PPIs. Use of proton pump inhibitors associated with depression. Now, we don't know that it's because of the fact that it was interfering with the vitamin activation. We can assume that that may have been part of it, but we know this is a, a study from last year. Using PPIs was associated with a higher depression score. No reason why, but we know that it was there. We also know that there are cases of PPI-induced neuropsychiatric symptoms this PPI specifically, but these were people with severe market anxiety attacks, panic attacks, night terrors, mental confusion, attention deficit, um, that was fairly severe, induced by a PPI. So we do have to be cautious about the medications we take. And in my belief, if somebody's taking a PPI for reflux, they should be dealing with the root cause of the reflux, not just taking the medication. But you don't want to stop, just to question you, you should never stop PPIs whole turkey because they can cause a very, very painful rebound. So it's important to wean off them safely and manage it in a safe way. Associ association of hormonal contraception with depression. Again, I talked about all contraceptives, the fact that they reduce your B vitamin activation. So again, what we're seeing here is a study that looked at whether people who took hormonal contraception had a higher incidence of depression. And we see that that is the case. Is it due to B vitamins? We don't know. Is it due to hormonal changes? We don't know. This study did not identify why, but it identified that relationship. And there are many botanicals that can also help. So some of the ones that I like to use most, curcumin is one of my favorites. Again, powerful antioxidant, powerful in reducing inflammation, really, really supportive in um, reducing stress-induced behavioral and biochemical changes. So Curcumin can be a wonderful botanical. And again, curcumin comes from turmeric. So using it in cooking is a fantastic way to do it. You can take it as an herb, and often it's um, better taken with black pepper, but it, it's more effective. But curcumin is a wonderful botanical to add to your arsenal if you're thinking about mood or inflammation in general. Some people do find St. John's wort is helpful. I use that somewhat less. Um, but I also like to focus on ashwagandha. And ashwagandha is an adaptogenic herb. And I tell people, one of the analogies I use with adaptogens is that, you know, whereas in traditional medicine, we tend to use antis, antifungal, antidepressant, antibiotic, something that stops the body from doing something or making something. Um, in natural and more traditional integrative medicine, it's really about letting the body you know, we use the seesaw analogy before I also use a tide. So for example, Anxiety is a normal emotion. Depression can also be a normal emotion, we, but in, let's use the anxiety example here. You're supposed to feel anxiety when you're presented with something that should make you stress. Some sort of um, danger will make you anxious. Your body should respond to that in an appropriate way. We don't want to just suppress the anxiety, but your body, once it's anxious, should then be able, the tide should roll back. The tide comes in, you feel anxious. The tide should roll back and you feel calm again. If your body, if the tide keeps rolling in and it's rolling in and you're getting a flood and you're not able to roll the tide back, 
then your body's not functioning properly. Ashwagandha and other adaptogenic herbs can help those tides to come back and forth, can help you navigate the ups and downs of anxiety and calming in a more natural way. So adaptogenic herbs can be very helpful for mood. Now, what diet is important? What is the best diet for mood? It's really right here. We're talking about green leafies up there, cruciferous vegetables, antioxidant berries, good healthy fats, clean fish, brightly colored antioxidant vegetables. Here's another example of some good healthy fats and plant proteins to help support our tyrosine and tryptophan, but also provide us with things like fiber and other nutrients. So this is, this is really the base of a good diet. One thing you'll notice here is there really isn't anything in a box. And I know we can't all live like that, but the more we can get to the root of our good quality foods, the better off we're going to be. These are some powerful anti-inflammatory foods. Now, this is not the best of them. This, this is, you know, a number of terrific ones, but this doesn't mean that other brightly colored foods are not also anti-inflammatory. But this is a nice little graphic about some of the foods you might want to try to add to your diet if they're not already part of it. Now, again, things like flaxseed provide lots of omega-3s. They also provide fiber. They also provide some protein. So they can, they're, they're doing double and triple duty in terms of helping us. You see the turmeric there, which is the spice that provides curcumin. So we've talked about that a little bit. Avocados for their good fats, berries for their antioxidant properties, walnuts, again, omega-3s, protein, fiber, all of the, and the broccoli and kale and garlic provide sulfur. Sulfur is really great for making glutathione. All of those are good glutathione precursors. And garlic, in addition, has antimicrobial properties. It kills germs. So it's great if your gut is affected. So all of these foods can be really powerfully beneficial for mood and for overall health. So when we choose these foods, one of the things that's super important is to make sure that we're choosing foods of good quality. There is evidence that glyphosate, which is Roundup, or glyphosate herbicides increase depressive-like behavior. This, again, was not a human study, but we did see increases in depressive-like behavior. There are also studies of other pesticides in humans it shows increased levels of depression in people who are exposed to pesticides. So if you're not already familiar, the Environmental Working Group has a wonderful list called the Dirty Dozen of the most toxic plants. Those are the ones, fruits and vegetables, essentially, those are the ones you don't really want to eat if you can't get them organic. They also have what they call the Clean 15. The Clean 15 are much safer, even if you buy them from con conventionally produced. So the quality of our food matters. I tend to really promote organic or grass-fed animals. They have a better nutritional profile. Those animals have not been fed antibiotics and have eaten pesticide-laden food and you know, gotten those into their bodies. So the cleaner your food, the better off you're going to be. But let's talk about if you can't you know, make everything from scratch and if you're not buying all natural foods, well, you know what? You can buy beet chips and carrot chips and sweet potato chips, and you can up your antioxidant intake that way and your fiber intake, and, and, and for your children, and, and they're still eating a bag of chips that maybe they feel more comfortable with. What about the benefits of rice cauliflower? Cauliflower can replace rice, it can replace other starchy foods in many, many combinations in your chili, in your potatoes, et cetera. You can use organic rice cauliflower instead. And I think the cauliflower industry has gone crazy. You know, they're so excited now because people are buying rice cauliflower in such a volume now. And again, cauliflower is a cruciferous vegetable, provides antioxidants, provides sulfur, and doesn't provide the starchy, the, the, the kind of nutrient poor starches that we get from rice. Now let's talk about fermented foods. Now you may not want to use kombucha, but miso and kimchi and, and properly made sauerkraut and properly made beets can be rich in fermented lacto-fermentation, which means they produce their own bacteria, and that's the good, healthy bacteria that our guts need. But for somebody who wants to drink a soda, maybe they can switch to something like kombucha because it's nice and fizzy and it gives them a, you know, kind of a boost in the middle of the day, but it's going to provide your gut with much needed bacteria to help it grow and colonize in a much more healthy way. Something like an RX bar or a Lara bar doesn't have a lot of whey proteins or soy proteins or rice 
syrups or all of those things that make an energy bar sound healthy, but really aren't. There's very little in here that didn't, there's nothing in here that didn't come from nature, essentially, and most of it is healthy for you. So there's, there's lots of ways we can make our diet healthy, even if we can't pick everything from scratch. So how do we optimize our outcomes? We have to dig deep. We have to look at what chemical imbalances may be causing symptoms and what is the root cause of those. And then we have to figure out those root causes, inflammation, nutrient deficits, poor gut function, mitochondrial dysfunction, genetics. Cover all those bases, check them out, find out what's working and what's not, and then address those underlying deficits. And then expand the toolkit. So when we talk about, when we talk about depression, anxiety, et cetera, we're often looking at medication. And like I said, I'm not against medication. I'm not against talk therapy for those who need it. They can improve outcomes. However, drug therapy and talk therapy with nutrition therapy and lifestyle change can make your outcomes even better. And in truth, nutrition and lifestyle should be the foundation and the others should come on top of that. So to, to finish, I ask everybody to think about sitting in this chair. And if you have if there is a mood disorder either that you're experiencing, your family is experiencing, you know, a loved one is experiencing, if you were to remove one of the legs of this chair, would you still be willing to sit in it? Because I believe that out of any of them, I think the men's are, should be the, late, the last thing you do, unless, of course, you know, it's a very, very acute situation. But again, Nutrition, lifestyle, therapy, all of those are foundationally important for good mental health. So thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, Vicki, we've got lots of questions. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I know we don't have a ton of time. Yeah, well, one of the... Yep. Mm -hmm. right. One of the first questions is just about handouts. You've got so much rich information. Can can we share them as handouts, or would you prefer that we watch the playback in YouTube after the talk? Um, how would I, I'm happy to give the PowerPoint to you, Denise. If there's a way we can make to make them into handouts, that's fine. Uh, yeah, we can definitely do that. So. I'll convert it to a. I'll convert it to handouts, and then I can send the link to everybody on the call after after. A, the talk, you should get them within an hour or two afterwards. So right. I'll get those out there. For everybody who was asking, they were saying, you know, it's so much great info and we can't even get all this written down in time. So thanks for doing that. Right. I know. I yeah. know it's hard. It's hard for me because there's so much I want to say and I don't want to miss anything. Yeah, yeah. And so one of the questions we got was about mania. So we talked a bit about, you know, you talked quite a bit about anxiety and depression and mood. Do you have any insight or have you seen any research on mania specifically related to nutritional support? There is. There is. And it's, again, more than I can get into here. But really, when we're talking about mania, we, you know, one of the things that I look at very carefully is glutamate and glutamine and how you can, and how you can calm that down. But it really, you know, mania is an area where, again, if somebody's really in an acute crisis, medications may be part of that, but that foundation still has to be there because inflammation is a part of it, glutamate processing is a part of it, um, and there's a, there is a lot more. I just, I just don't, that could be a whole other discussion. Well, that's great. But, then we'll have to have you back to talk about that. Sure. <laughs> sure. Okay. Another question we got was about identifying and finding clean omega-3s. So you talked a bit about the benefits of that specifically right. for mood disorders. So where can people, how, how do they know? Like what, what are the things that you're looking for in terms of how they're tested and where to source them? That's great. So I tend to recommend professional line supplements. The reason for that is I, there was actually just um, an article in the Washington Post about that, how the FDA wants to start um, studying supplements more and making more, um, doing more supervision. Now that's a slippery slope because on the one hand, I think it is truly important because supplements are not regulated in this country. And as a result, there is a lot of garbage out there. And the concern about the garbage is on the, at, at the least, if you're buying something that doesn't work because it doesn't have the actual ingredients in it that it says it does, then you're just wasting your money. But at the worst case scenario, the other problem is, you know, many things that come from China that use um, resources from China or other countries will be contaminated with heavy metals. 
So, at, you know, on the, on the worst case scenario, you may be taking something that's actually harmful. And there is really very little way to know if you just buy over-the-counter stuff. So I don't re recommend that. And I don't re recommend you buy anything from Amazon. Um, I mean, books is fine. Shirts is fine. Amazon's great. But so nutritional supplements, if you don't know who you're getting them from, I have done quite a amount of research on this. And very often, the ones on Amazon are either um, expired and relabeled or counterfeit. And even though it looks like the same bottle that you thought you bought from somebody else before, it may not be. So that is not a place you want to be buying your supplement. I know that I, as well as many of um, the other integrated practitioners I work with, do sell supplements on our website. Some people require you to have a code or be their client in order to do that. I do require that my clients have a code from me in order to have full access to my supplements. But I do also offer on my website, a there's a link to full scripts, which has packages that are kind of base packages. And I do have one that's a mood package. So for somebody who wants access to good quality supplements, that would be a way to get it. But many practitioners also offer that. Okay, great. Questions we're getting about prioritizing. So you've covered a great deal. Like it's great. You gave the big overview. So if you are a parent trying to triage this and prioritize like what are the first two or three things I'm going to try to get in there or what's the highest priority is it is diet first and then I try to start adding supplements or all at once what do I do so I think it it's the chicken and the egg because the diet is the kind of, it's going to be hard to change the diet it takes longer so in the you know in the early phase what you want to do is just get some of those nutrition those those nutrients in so I tend to start with the gut got to heal the gut. So if we're looking at something like a good probiotic, I recommend one that also that does include things that we know also has um, <clears throat> mood impact. So something like that Target GBX, I think is really, really helpful. There are others, but that's one that I liked, that I like a lot. But a good basic probiotic is something to really start with. Um, the other thing is, is the child eating enough protein? Try to push protein from a variety of sources. Are they getting enough fiber? Those are basic. But in omega-3, a good probiotic, a basic multi that has therapeutic doses of minerals and B vitamins is going to be key. Now, B vitamins in the beginning can be activating, so you want to start with those very, very slowly. So even with a multi, you might want to just give sprinkles to start, open up a capsule or open up, you know, take the powder and just give a little bit at a time. But you want to build up on B vitamins. I would think about if my child is on a PPI, can I wean them off it? because that, then they, I can activate their B vitamins better. But base, baseline stuff, MTHF, if you know you have the genetic mutation, is going to be pretty important. A good multi that has good quality Bs and good, good minerals, omega-3s, and a good probiotic are kind of the place to start while you work on improving the diet. That would be my goal. Okay. 